నమస్తే వెల్కమ్ టు దిస్ ఎడిషన్ ఆఫ్ ది సంరక్షణ జర్నల్ క్లబ్ దట్స్ జాయింట్లీ ఆర్గనైజ్డ్ విత్ ఐఆర్ఐఏ కొచ్చి అండ్ క్రస్ కొచ్చి దిస్ పర్టిక్యులర్ జర్నల్ క్లబ్ సిరీస్ ఎయిమ్స్ టు ఇంటిగ్రేట్ ఎవిడెన్స్ యాజ్ వీ నో ఇట్ విత్ క్లినికల్ డెసిషన్ మేకింగ్ ఇన్ ద ప్రీవియస్ ఎపిసోడ్ ఆఫ్ ది జర్నల్ క్లబ్ వీ హ్యావ్ లుక్డ్ అట్ commonly used terms evidence based terms with respect to effectiveness of diagnostic tests we have looked at sensitivity we have looked at specificity we have looked at predictive values and we have looked at the way they are commonly interpreted and misinterpreted in the evidence based literature and how that can impact on clinical decision making in this particular journal club we will look at a few terms clinical significance we look at statistical significance we look to see how do we integrate or align them with respect to clinical decision making we look at two of the most commonly used terms in the evidence based literature especially when we talk about statistical significance we look at p values we look at confidence intervals as usual we will be focusing on a conceptual interpretative approach rather than a mathematical formula based approach so the focus is not so much on how do we calculate them or how do we estimate them but on when you see them what are the common interpretations what are the common misinterpretations and how do you take that into your particular clinical practice we usually have four common clinical scenarios in the evidence based pedestal or pyramid the two scenarios that we are most interested in is where we find something is clinically significant but statistically insignificant or when we find something is statistically significant but clinically insignificant now these are the two scenarios where our interpretative skills our interpretation has to be on top of the game the learning objectives from this particular journal club include exploring the interaction between clinical and statistical significance with particular focus on its role in clinical decision making and to do that we will look specifically at two terms the two most commonly used terms p values confidence intervals i must repeat at this stage that the journal club aims to provoke thought it can be provocative it's not aim to give you a ready made answer it we don't intend to tell you that well this is what the answer is go ahead and take it and do it and apply it and that's it that's the end of it no that's not our aim the journal club aims to show you a path show you alternate approaches show you alternate ways of thinking and then to provoke you into finding out what might be the best approach for your clinical practice we'll use a case based approach like we did last time we have a 35 year old primary asian indian woman ivf conception with a body mass index of 31 years she has a singleton live fetus at 19 weeks ultrasound exam the mean uterine artery pi doppler study shows 90th percentile the estimated fetal weight is at the 15th percentile there are no structural abnormalities her blood pressure is 130 systolic 94 diastolic she doesn't have any other comorbidities you use an online risk estimator calculator to determine her risk of preterm pe and you input her data into that risk algorithm and you derive a risk for preterm PE of 1 in 105. Now this particular algorithm considers 1 in 100 as a cutoff for high risk. So as per the result of 1 in 105 that you get, she can be considered as low risk for the development of preterm PE. But you're a little concerned because 1 in 105 is quite close to 1 in 100. you also remember hearing or reading about a new intervention for the management of pregnancy induced hypertension 
you search your archives google it down pull it down and you find a recent rct from europe that has reported a new drug x in the management of pregnancy induced hypertension the authors reported a 3 mm drop in systolic blood pressure and a 2 mm drop in diastolic blood pressure within 4 hours of taking the medication and reported that the effects of the medication were sustained for up to 12 hours after which there was a gradual decline and then repeat a repeat dose brought the effect back up to where it ought to be the authors reported that there were no side effects from the drug either maternal side effects or fetal side effects or consequences in the childbirth process and childbirth outcomes the authors also reported that the p value was 0.04 and in their abstract concluded that drug x provides a statistically significant reduction in systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure now the question that you have in your mind is should i give this woman drug x is it going to be useful should i consider that for this woman the clinical question essentially builds around two blocks the first block is this woman at risk for developing preterm pe if this woman is at risk for developing preterm pe then then should i start her on drug x and the first question comes because there is an element of uncertainty in your mind that even though the risk algorithm says 1 and 1 not 5 is this woman still at risk for developing preterm pe at high risk for developing preterm preeclampsia let's look at the way that we usually arrive at a clinical decision it's a cognitive process a process of several blocks it might appear to be a spur of the moment decision it might appear to be something that is done by just a snap of the fingers in the hands of a very well experienced clinician but behind that spur of the moment what you think is a spur of the moment decision lies a very fast analysis of several factors building blocks a decision tree analysis if you want to call it that way what usually happens is that and the time duration within this within which this happens can vary from person to person depending on their experience their skill and their interpretative and thinking abilities cognitive abilities so what usually happens is that we are trained to recognize patterns we are trained to organize signs symptoms findings test results into patterns or into clusters of findings and then we match these particular patterns with a group of diagnoses it can happen that we are not even aware that we are doing that but that's what usually happens we match the patterns with a group of diagnoses we then work on eliminating diagnosis from this list based on a less likely approach it's less likely to be this it's less likely to be that it's not this it's not that and we narrow down to a smaller list of probable diagnosis and then fixate on one or two or three most likely or more likely diagnosis underlying the clinical decision making whether we like it or not whether we accept it or not whether we are aware of it or not is a process of quantification it can be very subtle it can be very obvious it can be quantification in the form of percentages in the form of absolute numbers in the form of proportions in the form of odds ratios relative risk risk ratios risk reduction or it can be very informal and just as it's more likely that this is that it's less likely that this is this but quantification in some form or the other whether your numerical value is assigned to it or not happens patterns are formed and recognized and the pattern formation and recognition 
ultimately depends on the number of patterns that are already stored in your memory. And the number of patterns that are already stored in your memory depend upon your clinical experience and the diversity of clinical cases that you have seen, as well as the patterns that you find through reading of the literature and your connections between what you have seen with your reading of the literature. So when you are seeing something, your memory box is being inundated with this particular set of patterns and it says, hey, we have been here before and this is what it is. These are the ones that came up when we had these patterns before. So naturally, the more experience you have with your clinics and the more reading that you do of the scientific literature, you get to identify more patterns. And as you identify more patterns, you're also storing them in your memory box for future use. And as more patterns fit, the likelihood of making errors or missing a diagnosis starts reducing. So that's why it's nice to have a greater clinical experience to see more diverse cases, as well as nice to actually try and read the literature as well. The cognitive process can be mathematical and if it is mathematical, it can be cumbersome, tedious, tiresome, especially in a busy OPD setting or in a busy clinical setting when diseases are multifactorial. Many factors come into play and there can be incremental increases in the risk either as additive increases or as multiplicative increases. For example, if the risk factor A increases the risk by 20% and another risk factor B increases the risk by 5%, the overall risk may, may increase by 20 plus 5, 25, an additive increase. Or it might be that the overall increase in risk can be multiplicative, it increases two times when risk factor B gets added to the mix. And so there are different permutations at play and when the disease is multifactorial, these different permutations are difficult to manage and can lead to errors in derivation of the final risk. And that's where cognitive reasoning is made easier through the use of algorithms and prediction rules, clinical prediction rules. However, when we look at algorithms or clinical prediction rules, we have to be clear that we have to be aware of the components of the particular algorithm or rules or patterns that are used. We need to know what has gone into the development of that algorithm, what is being collected, how is that being analyzed. We need to know the cutoff criteria and what determines or what's the transition from normal to non-normal that's being used in this particular algorithm. An example in fetal radiology would be an algorithm to determine if fetal growth restriction is there. And if that particular algorithm has used a particular growth chart and you use a different kind of growth chart to assess growth, you might end up with a very different result. So you need to know if that algorithm has used an estimated fetal weight less than third percentile as a cutoff for fetal growth restriction. While in your clinical practice, you are more likely to consider less than tenth percentile. Then you need to be aware of that difference to know what what is the transition between normal and non-normal that's being used in that particular algorithm. You also need to know how similar your clinical population is to the population in whom the algorithm was developed. And that we have seen that when we talked about sensitivity, specificity, and predictive values. We need to be very clear how our clinical population is either similar or dissimilar from the population that has been studied, or the population in which they are or in whom the algorithm was developed or the clinical prediction rules was developed. We also need to consider uncertainty in clinical care. The range of uncertainty 
is an important concept in clinical diagnosis, prognosis and therapy. Clinical diagnosis and care is about limiting uncertainty. It's also about establishing certainty, but it's about establishing certainty primarily through a process of eliminating or limiting uncertainty. It goes through a process of saying it's not this, it's not that, it's more likely not this, it's more likely not that. And then slowly reaching a set or a place of certainty with a range of uncertainty around it. That's more manageable or that's more acceptable. What do we know clinically in this particular case? Well, we have integrated evidence and clinical findings and we know that this particular woman is 35 years old. When we are integrating the evidence with that particular clinical finding or clinical demographic finding, we are saying that well, women aged 35 years or older are at higher risk for developing preterm preeclampsia. But this particular woman is right at the cusp of that transition, 35 years. We know that IVF conception increases the risk of preterm preeclampsia. She has had an IVF conception. We know that body mass index can increase the risk of preterm preeclampsia. And again, this particular woman is at the cusp. She can be considered obese if you are using a body mass index of 30 as a cutoff criteria for obesity. She can be considered as overweight. If you are using a body mass index of 30 as a criteria, cutoff criteria for overweight and 35 for obesity. So we need to be sure of the transition again, the categorization, the transition again between normal and non-normal, between the different body mass indices, between overweight and obese and how that impacts on the risk. We know that she is a primary, we know that preterm preeclampsia and preeclampsia is more common in primary gravids. We see that the uterine, mean uterine artery PI is at the 90th percentile. 90th, 95th percentile is considered as high risk. Would 90th percentile come within the range of uncertainty? Are you comfortable saying that, well, if it's 90th percentile, it's definitely in low risk or are you going to say that well 98th percentile is closer to 95th percentile and given all the other factors she might possibly she might possibly be at higher risk the estimated fetal weight is 15th at the 15th percentile again 15th is closer to the 10th percentile cutoff that's commonly used it's not further away from that and so would this fall within the range of uncertainty? The blood pressure is 130 bar 94. Again, does that fall within the range of uncertainty? Now, these are clinical questions. The range of uncertainty is something that you have to determine based on clinical relevance. What is a clinically important difference? What is a minimally important difference? Where would you consider it to be clinically significant even though it is not within that particular cutoff criteria i would still say that clinically i think that there is a range around that particular point estimate let's say 90 diastolic pressure i would say that well clinically i feel that there is a range of plus or minus five in the diastolic blood pressure as a range of uncertainty but i'm not sure whether it's going to be a high risk but I'm not sure it's going to be a low risk and I would be cautious about how I interpret that and I would like to interpret that then in the light of other clinical findings. But that particular margin is something that has to be clinically determined and the only person who can clinically determine the clinical margin is a clinician. So the algorithm gave us a preterm risk a risk for preterm preeclampsia of 1 in 105 and the algorithm does state that they consider 1 in 100 as the categorize as the cutoff criteria to categorize women into low risk or high risk and now again you are having <coughs> a risk of 1 in 105 and you need to consider whether that is within the range within the particular margin of uncertainty do I do I have a margin of uncertainty around a particular estimate that can account for 
gray zones where I'm not particularly sure that it definitely is a low risk. It definitely is a high risk. So we have several questions pertinent to this case. <clears throat> the first question is, is the cutoff for high risk 1 in 100 relevant to your clinical population? What is the range of uncertainty pertinent to this particular woman or this particular case? What is the range of clinically important differences? We also need to consider the incidence of preeclampsia in UK. I say UK because this particular algorithm that we used was developed in the United Kingdom. What is the incidence of preeclampsia in the United Kingdom compared to the incidence of preeclampsia in India? And the incidence of preeclampsia of the head is about 1 to 2 percent among pregnant women in the UK and it is about 8 to 10 percent among pregnant women in India. So there is a difference in the magnitude, there is a difference in the presentation, presentation in terms of magnitude and number of women that you might see with preeclampsia. We also need to consider modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors with respect to this woman and in pregnancy in general and we find that we can't modify age, we can't modify the type of conception, we can't modify the fact that she is a primary. There are few factors, risk factors in pregnancy that we can modify. Given that we have a small window of opportunity within, win within which to modify those risk factors and we have an even smaller window of opportunity for the effects to take place on either the mother's maternal well-being or on fetal well-being. Most of the risk factors have been there for some time prior to conception. We could consider body mass index to be a modifiable risk factor, but we know that gestational weight gain is something that occurs in pregnancy and that weight reduction during pregnancy has to happen within a per very short period of weeks during that period of gestation. And is that plausible? Is that feasible? Is that viable? Is that appropriate? How much can we reduce? So, even though we are aware of risk factors, even though we know the risk factors, there are few risk factors that we can modify. We can modify risk factors like comorbidities in terms of management or control, but we can't modify them in terms of the effects of duration of those particular risk factors. We need to consider access to care and follow up to care. If you're working in rural India, and even if you're working in other parts of India, you're aware that access to care is not equivalent or standard, standardized or always available for everyone and you're also, you're also aware that follow-up care is often irregular and does not always happen with the same physician, primary physician. We also need to consider the role of preeclampsia in perinatal mortality and morbidity in India, including its association with fetal growth restriction. So you're looking at all these other factors. You're looking at the consequences. You also look at the consequences of preeclampsia. You look at the potential obstetrical near miss associated with preeclampsia, the potential admission to an, either to an obstetric ICU or to a neonatal ICU. You look at fetal outcomes, you look at fetal morbidity, you look at access to care, you look at follow-up to care, you look at the incidence, you look at the study population difference as a difference in population between the UK and India. And now you factor all of this and then you have to make a decision whether 1 in 105 would you say that it definitely is a low risk? Would you say that you want to put that in a gray zone of or within the range of uncertainty? So there are several factors within the clinical pillars itself to look at when you are trying to reach a decision. And these, the answers to these factors come from evidence to a certain extent, come a lot from your own clinical experience and your evaluation of your experience. It's very important.
what we need to know, what we need to remember, what we need to reflect upon is that risk estimates, cutoff criteria, use of algorithms, they give you answers, they show you something as evidence, but they do not and cannot provide optimal results unless you connect that with your clinical experience and what you see in your clinical practice. What is the clinical scenario in your population? And if you want to connect evidence with your clinical experience, you have to evaluate your experience. And there is no way to evaluate your experience other than by documenting each case appropriately and going back and seeing what has happened, including carrying it to its logical conclusion about. So you need to be seeing what has happened in terms of outcomes as well. What we need to realize is that evidence and clinical experience are interwoven. They are part of the same fabric. Any separation of the two is an artificial separation. They are not separate pillars. They are not separate rolls of threads. They are interwoven. They are part of the same fabric. And any separation that you try to make of that in terms of saying that well, it can all be evidence, it can all be clinical experience alone. It's an artificial separation and it's bound to give you grief at some point or other. With respect to this particular case, then the question is, is there enough clinical uncertainty or certainty to use drug X? Can I say that this woman is definitely high risk? Then I'm certain, okay, I'm going to try that particular drug. Well, we, we haven't concluded that yet, but we, that's one direction that we take. Or even though the algorithm says, by going by the strict cutoff criteria of the algorithm, this particular woman might be considered as low risk, considering all the other factors, my clinical situation, the clinical scenario that I operate in, I might want to place this woman as potentially at high risk within a range of uncertainty, uncertainty and consider this particular woman for intervention with the drug X. Where are you? How do you see yourself addressing this particular question? Where do you want to place this particular woman? That's a decision that you have to make. It's one thing for us to just tell you, well, these are all the things there and so place this woman in this category. That's not the way it helps you in the long run. So that's the decision that you now have to make. Where do you want to place her? Do you think that there is enough clinical answer to place her within this category or that category? We can then move on to Look at how do we now integrate evidence further in this particular case scenario. And we'll, before we move on to that, let's take a step back and just look at a few points about statistical inferences and their relationship with evidence. Much of our discussion about evidence, unfortunately, uh, gets limited to statistics. There's little discussion that happens about cost effectiveness, little discussion that happens about societal implications, about other considerations. Much of the evidence-based discussion, unfortunately, is limited to statistics. Now, what we need to know about statistical inferences is that it depends on a complex web of assumptions. It's a complex web. It's a complex web of assumptions, a huge spider web of assumptions about how data were collected and analyzed. The full set of assumptions is then embodied in a statistical model. And the model, is, the statistical model that's built is a mathematical representation of data variability. Now there are several factors that we have to remember when we are now looking at the statistical model. We need to remember that there is a complex web of assumptions. Are all the assumptions clinically relevant, clinically valid? Are all the assumptions reasonable? Are all the assumptions true? Are all the assumptions met appropriately? It depends on how data is analyzed. It depends on how data is collected. Have we collected the data using in the right form? 
if it's to be collected as a in a continuous as a continuous variable have you collected it as a continuous variable stored it as a continuous variable or have you collected it as a categorical variable the test the statistical test that we use for that particular assumption is also an important consideration so the model is complex the model provides a mathematical representation of data variability hopefully we are able to accumulate accommodate all the data variability that is possible within that model so that also is an iffy thing it can happen it doesn't always happen let's be pragmatic and realistic about it the most important question from a clinical perspective is are the underlying assumptions clinically relevant if the underlying assumptions are not clinically relevant any amount of mathematical imputations mathematical permutations is not going to make it palatable so you need to be really sure that the underlying assumptions are clinically relevant it's something that's clinically po plausible possible feasible and again i reemphasize clinical relevance is something that the clinician has to determine define and give us inputs so that the mathematical model can be built that is a basic foundation for the development of the mathematical model what do we have here with respect to this particular case and we are looking at that paper we have an rct and we say okay well a randomized clinical trial a randomized control trial is the best design for interventions and that's why we use the best design we looked at the methodology and we say well they have followed the consort statement for rcts they have followed all the checklists they have done they have allocation random allocation method of randomization masking blinding everything has happened and it's happened in a reasonably good manner we find that we have a reduction in systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure that's statistically significant and they have reported a p value and the p value is less than 0.04 less than 0.05 it's they have actually given a specific p value 0.04 are we good to go are we good to now say that well there is a statistically significant reduction in systolic and diastolic blood pressure so i can give this medication i have decided well this particular woman is now in the range of uncertainty and given all the clinical permutations that are there and the access to care and follow up and the prevalence or incidence of preeclampsia in my setting i don't want to risk losing this woman without in, an intervention at this particular stage and then have get to see her at about 36 or 37 weeks with flore preeclampsia and potential fetal demise or fetal growth retardation restriction fetal complications maternal complications so i i prefer to say i want to be a bit cautious so can i now give this medication are we good to go more often than not when we talk about evidence based medicine we hear clinicians and others also say that well the p value is less than 0.05 so it's statistically significant and if it's statistically significant and we have shown statistical significance we can apply that to clinical practice we hear that often it's an argument that we often make we hear that often in general clubs as well well they have shown a statistically significant difference the p value is less than 0.05 so why not let's take it and let's apply it into clinical practice it works statistically significant so let's look at that p value and that cut off of less than 0.05 and straight off the bat let me tell you that is a bad practice to just look at that particular value and say that well it is statistically significant so let us take it into clinical practice absolutely bad practice and when i say absolutely bad practice it's a more decent way of telling what it actually is 
The correct use and interpretation of p-values requires an attention to detail. There are several things that go into the calculation of the p-value. There are several things that underlay the calculation, of, including the tests that are being used, the appropriateness of the tests that are being used, the assumptions that are being used to build a statistical model and the variability within the statistical model and all the factors that have gone into the build of the statistical model. So it places a high cognitive demand. That's not something that you can actually sit through and think through within a very busy clinical OPD. You have 30 other patients sitting outside the door waiting for you to interact with them, examine them, assess them. You don't, you, you're cognitively overloaded. And this is a very taxing overload. And so it's often something that you don't want to get into as a clinician. That has led to an epidemic, or can I say in this particular time, a pandemic of shortcut definitions and interpretations of the p-value. Well, if the p is this, this is what it means. If the p is that, that's what it means. And if this is p, this is how we interpret it. And most often than not, these shortcut definitions and interpretations are actually misinterpretations or overinterpretations and therefore wrong. But they permeate, permeate and percolate the scientific literature quite a bit. Quite a lot, actually. Let's look at this particular case. Can I say drug X is useful because the p-value is 0 0.04, less than 0 0.05, and hence the null hypothesis is rejected. And let's look at the hypothesis here. A null hypothesis would say that there is no difference between the groups, and you say, well, if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, I have rejected that. There is a difference between the two groups. It is statistically significant, so I can give the drug. Or we could have started off with a one-sided or a dividing hypothesis where we say that there is a difference between the groups. Drug X is superior or inferior to standard protocols. But I would consider drug X to be superior only if the effect is more than 10%. And drug X is inferior only if the effect is. There is a difference of about 10%. So there's a margin that I place there, a superiority margin and inferiority margin. And within that, I can have an equivalence margin also. That, well, drug X and the standard protocol are not exactly the same, but there is an equivalence margin that I place there within plus or minus five. If I use five as a number, plus or minus five percent. And so that's my margin of equivalence where I say clinically I feel that if it's within plus or minus five, that they be, I can consider them as equivalent. So we can have the hypothesis placed in either as a null hypothesis or a dividing hypothesis. But in a, in a dividing hypothesis, we still need to define, I keep coming back to this particular term, we still need to define the clinically important difference. And that is a clinician's job. That is a clinical definition. Well, the common statement that P less than 0 0.05 reject the hypothesis is a misinterpretation. That's not the way it usually works. A small p-value can occur because there was a large random error. A small p-value can occur when any of the assumptions that go into the building of the statistical model get violated or they're not properly met or properly measured. A small p-value can occur when the study protocol itself has been changed, has been violated, and there has been a change in the measurement or in the documentation or in the way a variable has been stored or in the way a variable or a set of variables have been analyzed. All of this can cause a small p-value. So the only thing that a small p-value states is that the data is unusual. And it is unusual, presuming that all the assumptions that went into the build of that particular statistical model is correct. Does statistical significance mean that we have found a scientifically or substantively uh, 
important relation no that's not the way we interpret the p-value again or the way we interpret statistical significance when a study is large when it has a larger than required a larger than necessary larger than needed number of participants very minor effects or small violations of assumptions can lead to statistically significant results so an appropriate sample size is very important we need to know how the sample size was calculated we need to know if the uh, what were the underlying assumptions to estimate that particular sample size and we need to know if that was appropriate if you have studied more than the required number of subjects there are ethical concerns with that about subjecting patients to a study when the effects are not going to be are not are already known if we can put it that way but there are also concerns with finding statistically significant changes just because we have studied a very large number of patients which may or may not be clinically relevant so an appropriate sample size is a very very important consideration and if you are seeing even you're reading the literature you really need to look at how was the sample size calculated what have the authors mentioned the assumptions that they have used to estimate the sample size is that appropriate so if a larger than appropriate sample size can create problems with the p-values it's natural to expect that a smaller than appropriate sample size can also create problems with the p-values when a study is small even very large significant effects can become drowned in noise and thus fail to be detected as statistically significant by a statistical test so both are problems having more than the required number of subjects having less than the required number of subjects both are problems so when you read uh, when you read the evidence when you read the paper you really need to be focusing on how many patients were studied and what were the assumptions that were underlying the estimation of the required number of patients to be studied is that appropriate it's worthwhile noting that the way you determine the sample size differs by the study design and can also differ by the type of clinical trial that you are doing so you need to be really conscious and cautious about the study design the methods that have been used and how the sample size has been estimated Another common misinterpretation is that statistical significance is a property of the phenomenon being studied, studied and thus statistical tests detect significance. Now the effect that is being tested either it exists or it does not exist. Statistical significance has nothing to do with that. What statistical significance tells you or shows you is a dichotomous description of a p-value. The statistical significance is a property of the result of the test that is being used to study a particular relation. The statistical significance does not is it is not a property of the effect or the population being studied. So just because we see statistical significance, it does not mean that something is clinically significant. That's not the way it works. So to summarize p-values, a p-value does not tell us whether the hypothesis targeted for testing is true or not. It does not tell us if assumptions that underlie the build of the statistical model have been violated or not. It does not tell us if the study protocol has been violated or not. It cannot tell us which assumption may have been violated. It cannot tell us which part of the protocol may have been violated. And to put quite to put it quite bluntly or honestly, the p-value says nothing specifically related to that hypothesis unless we can be completely assured that every assumption used for its computation is correct. And that 
is is very very difficult to ascertain especially because you don't find papers that describe how the model this particular statistical model has been built it's an abstract few sentences here and there if you are lucky enough but it's more put in abstract terms there is no way for you to know what assumptions have been are underlying the build of that particular statistical model so if that is the case then are we justified to rely on p values to make a clinical decision can i use drug x based only on the p value for this one can i tell that well the p value is 0.04 it's statistically significant so i want to start i want to start this woman on drug x the answer is an emphatic no i can't rely only on the p value the p value does not help me to reach that decision which then brings us to a question well the p value is the most commonly reported statistical what you say value in the ebm literature it's there it's there right left in the true ebm literature in the quasi or the semi ebm literature so if i can't use the p value then what do i do can i look at the range of uncertainty can statistics help me with the range of uncertainty how do i proceed then we come to the next common term that's most commonly reported in the ebm literature confidence intervals now a confidence interval is often used as a measure of the uncertainty around an estimate it's often used as a measure of uncertainty around an estimate so if the estimate let's say estimate in numerical terms is 80 then we might say that 80 is the point estimate and there is a range of uncertainty that it, that lies between 50 and 90 let's say as an example now the confidence interval may contain the true population parameter in a fixed percentage of samples when you do repeated sampling of the same population keeping all the assumptions that go into the calculation of the confidence interval intact by its very term an interval implies that there is a lower limit it implies that there is an upper limit and it implies that there is a range of values that lie within the lo- between the lower limit and the upper limit the true effect the true effect in the population may lie somewhere between it may not it doesn't say will it says it may lie somewhere in between the lower limit and the upper limit If you look at the EBM literature some interpretations of the confidence intervals include that a narrower confidence interval a narrower CI with the same confidence level indicate a higher precision of the estimate so you are using the confidence interval as a measure its width as a measure of the precision of the estimate you can also see interpretations that say that the width of a confidence interval is inversely related to a sample size so studies with a large number of subjects usually have more precise estimates and hence have a narrower confidence interval it can happen but we also need to be aware that the width of the confidence interval also depends on the data variability so we are seeing that we are looking at a precision estimate by looking at the width of the confidence interval and that same look at the width of the confidence interval can tell us well maybe the sample size is not sufficient enough and we maybe we should have had studied more number of subjects or we should have studied or we have studied less number of subjects we can also tell us that well there is a huge amount of data variability and maybe this confidence interval is not so <coughs> it cannot be interpreted so easily the choice of the confidence interval whether it's a 99% confidence interval a 90% confidence interval or a 95% confidence interval also affects the width this confidence interval widens 
when the confidence level increases. So if you are using a 99% confidence interval, the confidence interval will usually widen. If you are using a 95% confidence interval, it will shorten a bit. So these are some of the interpretations that go around confidence interval. These are some of the interpretations that are often put into play when we discuss journal articles or when journal articles are being discussed and conference intervals as per, are presented as part of the journal club. So coming back to the case, well then I can say if I can't use p-values, maybe let me look at the conference interval, let me see what they have reported. And I can look, let's say hypothetically for conference intervals pertinent to reduction in the systolic blood pressure because that's one of the major findings that the authors reported, reduction in diastolic blood pressure, difference in the proportion with reduced blood pressure in both the groups. I see that the paper says the mean reduction in systolic blood pressure is 3 millimeters, 95% CI is 1 to 5 millimeters. So what does that mean? Does it suggest that the true mean reduction of systolic blood pressure may be between 1 and 5 millimeters and 95% of P? What does that confidence interval actually mean? Now what we need to see is that the 95% that's mentioned there refers only to how often 95% confidence intervals computed from many studies would contain the true effect. If all the assumptions used to compute the intervals were correct. So it does not necessarily tell you that the true mean reduction will lie between 1 and 5 millimeter in 95 out of 100 times. It tells you that if you do a study many times from the same population or from many studies from the same population and all the assumptions that you have used to compute the intervals are correct and are met, then 95% of the, it tells you how often the 95% confidence intervals might contain the true effect. Can that be translated into a clinical application? It's very difficult to translate that into a clinical application. It actually doesn't make sense to take that particular value then and translate that into, clinical, into a clinical application. Even though the most common interpretation that we come across is that, well, 95 out of 100 times, if I the mean reduction in systolic blood pressure will be between 1 and 5 millimeters. That's not true. That's not what the conference interval states. And so that is a misinterpretation. In its true form, this particular interval is something that's very difficult to translate into a clinical application. The same applies when we look at diastolic blood pressure, two millimeters reduction, mean reduction, and a conference interval of one to three millimeters. Again, can I take that and apply it clinically in the way that it's commonly interpreted that, well, the mean reduction would lie between one and three millimeters. It may or may not lie. That's the whole point. It may or may not lie within that one and three millimeters. They have also reported that 25%, 95% CA, 10 and 32 are subjects who received drug X showed a reduction in BP. If you look at these numbers again, what we are seeing with the definition of confidence intervals, what it actually means, the way it was defined when it was developed, is that they do not really lend themselves to a statement that the true population parameter, true effect lies between this interval and that interval. So do confidence intervals yield an index of precision? No. I remember how we saw that many interpretations would say that, well, the narrower the CI is, the more precise the estimate is. So confidence intervals do not yield an index of precision. Are the values within the confidence interval always plausible and clinically significant or relevant? The answer is no. They need not always be clinically significant. You can have 
a clinically insignificant value lying between the limits of the conference interval or within that interval can the conference interval be read as a measure of certainty that the interval contains a true value no that's not the way that it is constructed so we are looking at three common misinterpretations of the next most commonly used term when we are talking about evidence based medicine and its clinical applications the next most commonly used term the interval estimation of the range of uncertainty using conference intervals so what can we say with some conference when we see the conference and how do we interpret that what we can say is that whenever the conference limits contain a clinically important effect the clinically significant effect cannot be ruled out irrespective of statistical significance doesn't matter if there is if it's statistically significant or insignificant if the conference limits contain a clinically important effect consider a clinically significant effect don't even go hunting further looking for statistical significance if the conference interval limits do not contain a clinically important effect question its clinical significance it does not matter if it is statistically significant or not so we are back to square one we are back to saying that you need to know what is a clinically significant difference a minimally important difference a clinically significant effect for your practice in your population and it's only if you know that only if you define and determine that that you can interpret conference intervals the way it has to be interpreted the way it was meant to be interpreted when it was developed in the 1950s so to repeat if the conference limits contain a clinically important effect you cannot rule out a clinically significant effect even if there is statistical insignificance and a conference interval that does not contain a clinically important effect questions clinical significance even if the result is statistically significant for conference intervals and p values to be valid it's crucial that they have been calculated by appropriate methods as different statistical models have different underlying assumptions and it's very rare for us to see in any paper how the conference intervals were calculated what were the assumptions that have been used what methods have been used it's not just a single method that's there to calculate the conference interval and each method each method each statistical model has different underlying assumptions so in reality even if the mess analysis methods are appropriate real world data seldom perfectly meet all assumptions and real world p values and conference intervals are therefore not exactly what they claim to be there are few issues that you that that we have brought up here one that no one tells what assumptions have been used what underlying assumptions have been used that's not part of the literature it's not part of the methods it's not there usually very rare to see that unless it's a method it's a paper on statistical method it's very rare to it's very rare to see that no one describes the statistical model that's been used the underlying assumptions of a statistical model that's been used it's a test name it's a series of test names it's a let's say a regression model has been used they say step wise or backward forward approach has been used but no one really puts out there the assumptions that underlie the model that's been used and when the assumptions that underlie the model that have been used are not there there's there's no way you can check whether those assumptions have been met or not and so hence there is no way for you to correctly interpret 
the p values or the cas we also need to consider bias bias can substantially distort effect sizes can substantially distort outcomes and it's crucial to consider the sources of potential bias in the interpretation of study results for most parts we don't see a discussion of bias when we consider study results it's not usually a part of the discussion it's not usually a part of the study methods except for few terms that are thrown in once in a while that's not usually part of the clinical literature clinical decision making literature for most parts i'm not saying it's altogether not that it's there you might hear about selection bias you might hear about different kinds of allocation bias you might hear different kinds of bias that are placed there but a discussion on how that particular bias a detailed critical analysis of how that particular bias can influence the study results is not usual part of is not usually a part of the literature now all of this does not mean that they have not been considered it does not mean that this omission is malicious it's also that papers have word limits and not everything can be placed within the context of a paper and so many things get diluted get knocked off and we end up presenting only what we feel should be presented and that's another factor that you need to keep in mind when you interpret p values and confidence intervals or any statistical result for that matter that the presentation is based on what the author feels has to be presented more in support of what they feel the results should be as all bias can hardly ever be excluded and since statistics is not meant to and never provides definitive answers it's very very important that you interpret research results carefully don't view them as conclusive evidence don't just look at the abstract and say and then look at the conclusion in the abstracts and say well here the results say statistical significance is there so let's go ahead and use it no that's not the way it's supposed to be statistical testing is not meant to give you conclusive clinical evidence it's meant to give you a way something to integrate within your clinical experience and then arrive at a clinical judgment statistics is meant to give you a range of uncertainty or a range of certainty you the clinician have to interpret the results and then integrate it with your clinical judgment based on your clinical experience so we are coming back again your clinical experience matters if you want to improve care for your population you have to be documenting your clinical experience in your clinical population and you have to be looking at what is happening there your clinical judgment of what is a clinically important difference matters what do you want as a clinician you want to know if i am using an interval for a range of uncertainty does that interval contain the true value you want to know which values within that particular i'm saying 1 mm and 5 mm some mercury which values within that particular limits with it between the upper limit and the lower limit should be taken seriously when i say should be taken seriously i am implying that are clinically relevant you also want to quantify the precision of the estimate you want to know is this estimate precise by how much how can i use it neither the p values nor the confidence intervals lead us there but we often use the p values and the confidence interval as surrogates for that for that decision making so the question we raise as part of this particular general club is 
Why do evidence-based clinical decisions rely heavily on p-values and confidence intervals? And is that reliance appropriate? Has that reliance actually led to improved patient outcomes? Has that reliance actually led to an improvement in healthcare settings? So when we talk about evidence-based medicine, when we talk about how we use evidence-based medicine in clinical decision making, when we talk about p-values and when we talk about conference intervals, when we talk about clinical significance, when we talk about statistical significance, ultimately we have to see all that translate into an improved patient experience and outcome. And what we need to question is, has the reliance on p-values and conference intervals actually led us there? Are we seeing a change in the healthcare statistics across the country when, when we are using this to drive <coughs> clinical decision making? We could use credible in intervals instead and credible intervals we'll leave that for a later time. It's not something that can be covered in this particular session. So we'll have a separate session on that later. But credible intervals are a better alternative to conference intervals and they use Bayesian theorems and systems. And we'll talk about that later as part of a separate journal club session. So what does our discussion tell us now? The most important takeaway is clinical significance cannot be exclusively answered by statistics. It has to be addressed by clinical judgment. Now for every clinician who is jumping up and down with excitement saying, yippee, I told you, you statisticians are just making the waters murky and muddy and our clinical experience matters and underlying condition or assumption there is that clinicians actually will evaluate their own outcomes in an objective unbiased manner and it's only when they do that that the true version of clinical significance or the true definition of clinical significance actually gets uncovered clinicians need to define what's a clinically important difference or the minimally important difference that is not a statistical derivation that has to be done by the clinician and for the clinician to do that, the clinician has to look back at their own clinical experience and outcomes. Again, we need to look at, we need to consider that a clinically important difference can differ based upon the context in which it's used. A reduction of 2 millimeter diastolic blood pressure may be clinically insignificant in terms of control. But if it leads to a, an, even a 5% reduction in mortality, the concept of clinical significance for the 2 millimeter reduction in diastolic blood pressure changes from an individual perspective, from a societal perspective. So clinical significance is something that you need to consider from various angles and you need to be inputting evidence into it, you need to be looking at sociodemographic factors, clinical demographic factors, risk factors, societal implications, individual implications, cost effectiveness, cost ethics. There's a whole set of things that come into the definition of clinical significance. It is not just something that is a purely clinical parameter. When you take it, when you take that clinical parameter and now you're moving it into the context of clinical significance, you're going to be taking a whole set of factors around it and then say that considering all these factors, I would say that this is a clinically significant, clinically relevant, clinically important difference. To repeat, we want meaningful interpretations that we can translate into clinics that can help patient care Clinicians have to define and determine clinically important differences or minimally important differences or what's clinically relevant and understand and realize that that is not a statistical determination. Again to emphasize, 
clinicians can do that only if they evaluate their data for their population. So it doesn't matter in which setting you are. It doesn't matter if you are in a tertiary care setting. It doesn't matter if you are in a secondary care setting, in a primary care setting, in a rural setting, in a remote setting. You want to improve patient outcomes for your population. You want to improve yourself as a clinician so that you provide better care for your population. You have to document, you have to examine, you have to evaluate your outcomes. There's no other way. There's just no other way. <coughs> Statistical testing is meant to guide. It's meant to guide. Taking that and then using it as a surrogate for conclusive evidence is just wrong. That has not been the purpose of statistical testing. So to take it and use it as conclusive evidence, focusing only on statistical significance is wrong. Clinical decision making needs an understanding of three pillars. It's a, it's a mix. It's a mix of evidence. It's a mix of experience, your clinical experience. It's a mix of ethics. One or two pillars alone don't suffice. You can't say that, well, I've read a lot of evidence, I understand a lot of evidence, but you don't integrate that into your experience. Doesn't help. You say that I have got a lot of experience, I've seen a lot of patients, but you don't evaluate your own outcomes, your own data. You don't look at the evidence that's out there. You don't integrate the evidence with your experience. You might find that you're right a lot of times, but you can be right just by chance as well. So you don't know if it's actually your skill at play and you can't see how you can improve upon your skills. So that also is not optimal. There's no way to learn how to integrate evidence with your experience unless you read more of the literature. There is no way for you to improve your clinical experience unless you evaluate your clinical experience. So reading the literature matters, evaluating your clinical experience matters, both matter. And when you say read the evidence, read the literature, it then means that you need to know how to read the literature. That's an important step. It's not just reading the literature, it's also knowing what you should be looking for and how do you read the literature. And that's again a topic that we will come to in subsequent journal clubs. How do we, how do you look at the literature? How do you see what's happening? How do you take that evidence and then integrate it with your clinical experience? So thank you. As we mentioned in the very beginning, we are going to leave you with a set of questions. We are not giving you a clear-cut answer. With this particular case, we are not going to tell you that, well, you should give, consider this woman as, consider this woman as clinically significant, at high risk, and give her the medication. No, that's not the way that we are going to look at it. We are not going to tell you that, well, this is a low risk woman, don't give the medication. We are not going to tell you that, well, the medication works, give it. What we are doing, what we aim to do, what we want to do is leave you with a set of questions. We encourage you to go back, reflect on these questions, look at your clinical practice, think over how you would think through applying this to a patient that you see in your own clinical practice. Thank you once again and hopefully we will see you in the next Journal Club as well.